Okay, so we, uh, for the past few weeks, we've been talking about what? God, yes, good. Setting God-sized goals, right? Setting God-sized goals. Let me ask you this. Has anybody made a goal for this year to get stronger? Anybody? Let's be honest. Get stronger? Okay. Gage, you're always looking to be stronger. Yeah, okay. What do you do? What do you do to get stronger? Lift some weights. What are, you, what are you doing to get stronger, McCoy? Nothing, but you set a goal to get stronger. I like it. That's my kind of goal. What? It's not talk- what, what do you, Gage, what, do you, what, do you, what are some like, practical goals that you set to get stronger? All right, like leg day. Nice. Yeah, nice. You can just eat bacon instead. It's protein. All right, so here we go. Well, I've got a little strength competition I want to do. All right, I need, uh, I don't know, who thinks we're strong? Okay, 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 okay. Um, all right, here we go. All of you, the, like, I need maybe three, four of you, okay? All right, who think you're strong? I need you to come stand over here. I need you to come stand over here. All right, three of you? Okay, here we go. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do forearm plank challenge. Nice work. Six-minute plank. Well done. Okay. All right. Good work, good work, good work. I'm proud. You guys are strong. That's good. Okay, so I don't know what that has to do with anything about goals except for I want to see how strong you were. All right, so, so good work. But here we go. Listen, listen. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, we started a series by kind of talking about New Year's resolutions. Now, did you know that after two weeks, uh, most people have already given up on their New Year's resolutions? Does anybody already? Yeah, same with me. Like, I still haven't set one, so I can't give up on it if I don't set one, right? Uh, by the end of January, statistically, by the end of January, fewer than 25% of people are still committed to their New Year's resolutions. Why is that? If we're really honest, achieving goals is pretty difficult. It's difficult work to achieve goals. Even when we have the best plans, even when we have all the details laid out, even when we've set our mind on something, it still takes hard work, it still takes perseverance, it still takes commitment to follow through on those goals. Now, I don't know what your goals are. Maybe you have a lot of different goals in your life. Maybe you have spiritual goals. Like you want to grow closer to God in this year. Maybe your, maybe your goals are physical, to get stronger, to be able to do longer planks. I don't know what your goals are. Maybe they're mental goals, like I want to be smarter, I want to be able to focus more, I want to, I want to read more. Maybe they're relational goals, I want to be in better relationship with my mom and my dad or my friends, my family. Maybe even you have some God-sized goals in your life. Like God has placed these passions and desires in your life and you've set these goals of things that you want to do that are God-sized goals. Whatever your goal is right now, I have some good news for you and I have some bad news for you, all right? The bad news is this. If you haven't already, you're probably going to experience a little bit of opposition, some frustration, a lack of motivation. You're going to experience some of these obstacles in accomplishing your goal. How many of you have experienced that when pursuing your goals? Frustration, opposition, lack of motivation. There's also good news, though. There is hope for accomplishing our goals. Whatever those goals are, whether, again, they're relationship goals or, or uh, mental goals or physical goals or spiritual goals or God-sized goals, whatever they are, there's hopes. There's, there's hope that we can accomplish and we can pursue our goals. Um, when things get difficult, when we're pursuing our goals and they seem overwhelming to us, when we're pursuing our goals and people are telling us that we can't, we can't accomplish these goals. Whatever the, the obstacle may be, there is hope that we can accomplish these goals. And so for the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about what does it look like to set God-sized goals? What does it, set, what does it look like to pursue God-sized goals? And last week, if you remember, we, we talked about how God created you, God designed you to accomplish God-sized goals, right? And, we, and somebody remind me, who have we been looking at, the story that we've been looking at uh, to talk about goals? What's the guy's name? <laughs> the, yeah, the, the wall dude, right? Starts with an N. Nehemiah. Nehemiah, right. Okay, so last week we talked about you have, God's given you the things that you need to accomplish the goals that he places in your life, right? So we talked about you have, 
yourself, right? You have your skills, your experiences. You have, oh, that probably wasn't smart. You have yourself, you have your stuff, your resources. You have things that you have, but you also have connections with, with other people uh, that God has given you in order to accomplish goals. You have that. You have, uh, you have others. Not only do you have connections with others, but you have others who might have the same kind of desires and passions and goals that you can, you can team up with. And again, this is all based on Nehemiah's story. You have others to help you accomplish those goals. Breaking bricks. And ultimately, you have God, right? Like, uh, Nehemiah fasted and prayed all throughout the process of pursuing his goals, and we have that same connection uh, to God available to us in the pursuit of our goals. So let's just kind of recap really quick. Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah, uh, his people, his ancestors were kind of pushed out of their homeland. They were in exile. Throughout several years, it was time for, for his people to kind of start going back to Jerusalem. And how did he find the land of Jerusalem? Or how did people find it? Like, what did, what did Nehemiah hear about it? Was it in good condition or bad condition? Right, it was, in back, it, was, it was in ruins. The wall was still destroyed. The temple had been destroyed, and it was just not good. And so Nehemiah had this God-sized goal based on a problem. He had this God-sized goal to go back to the land of his ancestors and to, to rebuild this land, right? So he goes back. And, and, he, and he gathers up people, he, uh, he, he encourages people to, to be on his team, to kind of uh, be in this together, to work together to accomplish this goal of rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the walls, and making this homeland into something that was what he had heard stories about from his ancestors. Right? This God-sized goal that had been based on a difficulty, and Nehemiah pursued it. And we talked about how, again, God-sized goals oftentimes comes, come from difficulties. When we see difficulties arise, it gives us these God-sized goals in our lives that we can pursue. And we talked about last week how God has given us what we need. You were, you were made to pursue God-sized goals. Again, those four things that God has given you, you pursue those goals. Now, once Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem, he had gotten the permission uh, from, from the, the leadership, and he, they said, yeah, you can go, uh, and, he, and he gets to Jerusalem, and he, and he got right to work, right? We talked about, again, the, the resources that he had. Um, he recruited people to help. If you look in Nehemiah chapter 3, we're not going to read through all of that, but, uh, but if you just look through Nehemiah 3, basically it lists out all the different people and families and clans that Nehemiah was able to, to get on his team. In fact, it spells it out. So like, for instance, uh, El- Eliashib, I don't know how you say these names, Eliashib and his fellow priests rebuilt the sheep gate. And then Hassaneah, again, who knows how to say it, Hassaneah rebuilt the fish gate. Joida and Meshul- Meshulam rebuilt the Jashana gate. In other words, uh, it's an entire chapter devoted to Nehemiah gathering up all of these people and assigning these different places to work. In other words, he's getting these people on his team who have similar desires and passions to accomplish this God-sized goal of rebuilding Jerusalem. Unfortunately, though, his co-workers, his teammates that he had recruited, they weren't the only ones around. Let's take a look here uh, about some of, the, some of the haters or some of the obstacles that Nehemiah came across in the pursuit of his goals. Uh, in, in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, just a few verses real quick. Listen to this. Again, think of Nehemiah pursuing his God-sized goals. Again, think of you pursuing your own goals and some of the things that you, uh, you come across, the things that you face in the pursuit of your goals. Listen to this. When Sanballat heard that, uh, that we were rebuilding the wall, this is Nehemiah talking, when he heard that we were re- rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, if even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their walls of stones. These guys were jerks, right? Like in the midst of, of, of Nehemiah gathering all of his people and pursuing this goal that was a, a lofty goal and it was a noble goal, uh, there's these, these groups of people that were kind of uh, hating on Nehemiah and his people. Right? They were mocking them, saying, like, you guys can't build anything. If you build that wall, 
a fox couldn't even jump on it without the wall falling down. And, and surely they're not going to do what they said. They're, and, and so they're, they're nagging them and they're, they're opposing them and they're hating on this pursuit of this God-sized goal. Have you ever been there before? You have this goal and when, when someone hears about your goal, they're like, nah, you can't do that. Like, Gage, you can't be stronger than me. There's no way that you can do that. I'm just kidding. You probably already are. You ever experienced that, though? You're pursuing a goal and there's opposition. There's people who, who kind of, who are naysayers, who say, no, nah, you can't accomplish that goal. How do we do that? How do we, how do we, uh, how do we push through that? How do we continue to work towards our God-sized goal? Well, again, we're looking at the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, Nehemiah was uh, presented with these obstacles. He was presented with these haters. Well, let's take a look and see um, how Nehemiah handled it. Again, in chapter 4, right? These guys are saying, if even a fox steps on this wall, it's going to fall down. And here's what Nehemiah does. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. It's kind of like that saying, like, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say. What, how's it go? You guys I know that? I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you. <laughs> so like when, when Hannah calls me an idiot, it bounces off me, and now she's an idiot. You guys don't know that? Oh my gosh. Y'all don't say that to each other anymore? Okay, anyway, so... Uh, well, that went over like a lead balloon. Okay, so uh, Nehemiah says, turn their, in-, again, he's crying out to God. He says, turn their insults back on their own heads. What do they say to me? Turn it back onto them. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sin- sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. How does Nehemiah continue to pursue his goal in the midst of these haters, in the midst of these naysayers who are saying, no, you can't do this. Here's what I noticed from Nehemiah. First is this. Nehemiah didn't get distracted. He didn't fight with these guys. Notice in his response to this, when you've got these naysayers and these haters, who does Nehemiah respond to? Is it the haters? No, he responds to God. He cries out to God. How many times in our lives do we get so caught up in in the naysayers and the drama because we just feed right into it because we just have to respond, right? Like we have these, these people who are saying something about me, and so I just have to respond. What's Nehemiah do? He doesn't even take the time to respond. He doesn't get distracted by responding to these people. He just takes it straight to God. He doesn't get distracted by the haters. He doesn't get sucked into the drama. Second thing I notice that Nehemiah does is Nehemiah, again, takes it to God. He asked God to hear his prayers, and he asked God to make it right. Now, what I love is that he didn't, like, sugarcoat this, and he didn't say, like, oh, these cute little haters, like, just bless their hearts, right? Like, he said, no, like, like, turn their insults back onto their head. I hope you smite them. Like, I hope that they are treated like plunders, and, like, and and, and and he's very honest with God and saying, like, these guys are jerks, and I want the worst thing. He's very honest in saying that. But he doesn't do that to them. He takes it to God. He, t- he takes his problems to God. He just asks that God would take care of it. And then the third thing I see Nehemiah doing is he just keeps going. He doesn't stop to address the haters. He doesn't, he doesn't allow their, their uh, mocking. He doesn't allow their harsh words to kind of to slow him down. He just keeps going, pursuing his God-sized goal. Let's see what happens next. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the, people of, uh, and the people of Ashid heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and the, that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to their work. When the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting uh, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, 
and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that they were, when the enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon with the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, The work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night as workers and as workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. So the, the, after, this, after this initial attack on them and Nehemiah kind of ignores it and takes it to God, Things didn't let up. In fact, this, this kind of opposition to Nehemiah's God-sized goal had become relentless. It grew intense. And even to the point where, where his team were feeling like they were running out of strength. Like their strength was just, uh, they were at their wit's end. They couldn't take it anymore. They couldn't take all of this opposition. Pursuing this God-sized goal had become simply too much. And they were just about ready to give up. But Nehemiah was committed to to this God-sized goal. Not only was he committed, though, he was strategic. Again, let me point to you to a few things that Nehemiah did in the midst of opposition of his God-sized goal, in pursuit of his God-sized goal. Again, let me just tell you this. This isn't just so that we can say, oh, good job, Nehemiah, well done, right? This is so that we can say, okay, in our pursuit of our goals, whether it be physical goals, mental goals, spiritual goals, relational goals, or God-sized, big, massive-sized goals, whatever those goals are, we can say, how do we pursue those God-sized goals in our lives in times of opposition? Because the truth is that opposition will come. What did Nehemiah do? He took it to God. Again, what does he do? He cries out to God and says, God, God, these, these haters keep, they keep coming at me and, and, and we're exhausted. My people are tired. Help us, fight for us, God. He takes it to God. He's in constant communication with God. The second thing he does is this. He prioritized rest. Now, this isn't really something that you hear about when you're talking about pursuing goals, especially when it's a goal like getting strong or getting faster or, or making the team or, or like getting a 7.0 GPA or whatever your goals may be. The, one of the things that you don't hear very often is to prioritize rest, right? Because when you're resting, you could be lifting weights or you could be working on your plank time, whatever the case may be, or maybe you may be working on your, your jump shot, but instead... Nehemiah prioritized rest. Notice how he created shifts. Like this, this group of people was going to, to work. This group of people were going to rest because their strength was, was running out. They were weary. They were tired. And so Nehemiah prioritized rest. You can't accomplish your goal if you're so exhausted that you just can't go any further. Next thing that Nehemiah did was choose community. He prioritized community remember in there how it said the work was so spread out and they were so spread out so what did he do he placed groups by families he kept the families family units together to work together in one spot prioritizing this idea of community that you're not going to work at this alone because if you're pursuing this a goal this goal alone and this opposition comes it's so much easier to give up and when you have a group of people there working with you he chose community And lastly, again, I said it before, but he kept going. He just kept going. He wasn't going to allow these haters and these these obstacles and this opposition to to stop him from pursuing his goal. He just kept going. He had to adjust his plan at times, right? Like his plan didn't remain the same. He had to keep adjusting it, but he just kept going. And it would be nice to wrap the story up with a nice little bow and say that his opposition ended after this and everything was good and he accomplished his goal and everything was just easy, but the truth is it didn't. He even began to get letters and death threats about the work and the goal that he was pursuing. But there's one last thing, one last reaction, one last response that Nehemiah does that I want you to see. 
It's found in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 9. They were, and he says this, they were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, listen to this, don't miss this. When his goal was, when his, the pursuit of his goal was under attack and they were exhausted, Nehemiah's prayer was this, and it was simply, now strengthen my hands. Now, I don't know about you, but all of, all, all of the things that he could have prayed for, like me, I would have prayed that my opposition hands might have fallen off, or their mouths would have fallen off, their tongues would have fallen off, so that they couldn't talk all of this trash, right? Like, I would have prayed something against them, but Nehemiah just prays that his hands would be strengthened, that he could pursue and accomplish the goal that was set before him. So again, what are your goals? What are the goals that you have for your life? The little goals, but also the big God-sized goals. Have you experienced this frustration? Have you experienced this, this frustration where the haters are just, man, they're just, they just, they're just relentless and they won't let it go and they just keep attacking you and bringing you down? Maybe you've just given up because it's just hopeless. Maybe you've become frustrated. Maybe you've just started to lack motivation. Can I encourage you to take, the, to take the model of Nehemiah, take it to God, take your obstacles, take your haters to God, cry out to God. Don't hold back your feelings. Like You don't have to sugarcoat your feelings when you're taking it to God, but take it to God. Rest. Honestly, how often do you hear the instruction to just rest <laughs> in the pursuit of your goals in the midst of your your pursuing uh, the, these goals in your life how often do you hear just just rest like, take a step back and rest the third thing is find your community again going from Nehemiah's example find your community who's your community us as a big community your small group maybe you have friends at school that are your community Who's your community that's going to come around you in the time of pursuing your goal when things get difficult? Find your community. And lastly is this, just keep going. <laughs> just keep going even in the midst of those obstacles, in the midst of pursuing your God-sized goals. Just keep going. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the story of Nehemiah and the things that we can gain from that story and we can apply to our lives. God, thank you for... Uh, giving us desires and, and passions and goals in our lives of things that you have called us to and the things that you've set out for us. God, I pray that in the midst of obstacles, in the midst of hard times, in the midst of frustration, in the midst of even just wanting you to give up or having given up on some of our goals, God, I pray that you would help us to take these things that Nehemiah did and apply them to our lives. Not so that we can finish it and say, wow, look what I did, but we can say, man, my community is better because of this goal that I accomplished, and look how good my God is. Thank you for your love for us and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.